Yes, a warm welcome also from my side. Uh, I'm Barbara Duhos. Uh, I'm from the Helmut Schmidt University, where I specialize in international economics. And I have the pleasure of uh, chairing the second session. And um, Michael Pflüger already mentioned um, that uh, Ricardo is also very exciting uh, from um, um, our times. And um, uh, we had a lot of discussion already from uh, his time that there was a lot of critique on him and so on and so forth. And even within the profession, the late uh, Paul Samuelson was, was skeptical about whether uh, Ricardo applies today. Uh, and he had a little bit of uh, conversation with uh, Jagdish Bhagwati, and um, maybe two or three questions are standing out. One, of course, has been mentioned, uh, what if China catches up? Doesn't that change everything? And uh, isn't uh, comparative advantage very much spoiled nowadays by uh, economic policies and big business, for instance, uh, so that we have the notion of uh, competitive uh, advantage uh, rather than comparative advantage, uh, which is the underlying uh, scarcities. Uh, and uh, the third question probably uh, is, um, well, it's not about final goods anymore, about cloth on the one hand and uh, wine on the other hand. Uh, but we have very much vertical trade and offshoring and uh, how do, do those concepts apply today? And I'm very pleased to have three experts uh, here uh, on this issue. First, I'd like to introduce Samuel Cottom, and he kicked off the debate a new a couple of years ago with a colleague of him. Uh, and uh, he uh, supplied us the tools uh, to uh, manage also and to interpret what's going on nowadays and what Ricardo tells us uh, about what's going on nowadays and how productively this concept can be applied. Um, may I hand over the floor to you? Well, it's an honor to be here. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, insights of Ricardo. And I should say from the outset that this is, although my co-author didn't approve these slides, uh, he's very much involved in all my thinking on this. And that's Jonathan Eaton. Um, but I wanted to start out with something very personal. I was thinking back to when I first learned about Ricardo. I was taking a, a class in the history of economic thought as an undergraduate at Wesleyan University in Connecticut. And uh, I had a very good professor, William Barber, who uh, died last year. Um, and of all the things we did, it was really the Ricardian parts, the one that stuck with me. Now, in fact, it probably wasn't on foreign trade. It was actually the chapter I really loved was on rent, because it was just such a neat way to think about uh, the issue of what determines which land is going to get the higher rent. And I think that as well is still with us. But, I, but then it was really with Jonathan Eaton that I then got very much involved with uh, Ricardo's uh, theory of trade. So uh, I came late to it. Now, Jonathan and I were writing a paper for the Journal of Economic Perspectives. And we were, I mean, I'm attributing this line to him because as we were sitting at the computer, it was really suddenly got this burst of inspiration for our introduction and had this comment about the uh, Ricardian model being like a family heirloom that you bring down and show the kids and, you know, think about, you know, the, the history of the family and then uh, you put it back and then tell them to go uh, do their own thing. So that's sort of our characterization of um, uh, a long period of the Ricardian model not being used so much. I think uh, Daniel mentioned that, you know, so, sort of since the 1930s or so, it was sort of out of fashion as the main way of thinking about international trade. So today's talk, I wanted to talk both about a renewed interest in the Ricardian model, renewed uses of it, um, expanding uses of it, uses of it in a more quantitative way than before, I would say. And then I wanted to ask a new question of it to just kind of 
say that it, it, it's, it's very much alive and there, there are still issues we don't understand that we can understand better using some of the Ricardian logic. And that was really the question about offshoring, which in fact does tie into some concerns that uh, Samuelson had voiced as well. Uh, but putting Ricardo to work, what's the challenge? So what I mean by putting it to work is meaning actually using it in an empirical analysis in current policy issues and so on. And what's very difficult about the Ricardian model is the taxonomy that it generates, the taxonomy of equilibria that one gets. In particular, right off the bat, you get these two types of equilibria, even in the simplest case, because as we saw, Ricardo didn't tell us the preferences, and so we could think about different relative prices and then the utility function that would have generated them. And in one setting, you could have a situation where one of the countries produces both, it uh, could have been England, produces both wine and cloth, and then you'd expect Portugal to be uh, uh, specialized in wine, or it could have been the opposite, that Portugal was producing both and, and England was specialized, although you expect the smaller country to be the one that would be specialized. But the fa or they could both be specialized. So right off the bat, there's this kind of a, a difficult thing that you get these two types of equilibria in a very simple little model. Um, uh, and uh, it, it, nonetheless, one can work with this model. I should have mentioned Daniel uh, Bernhoven's work with it, but I, in this slide, I'm mentioning recent work by uh, Costano and Donaldson, who really use it in its stark form, but in a higher dimension to understand the uh, uh, a century of U.S. agriculture. And the trick for them, the key piece of information they need, which is not readily available for most industries, is to know what product, what efficiency would have been in an industry that's actually not producing anything. In other words, could you go to uh, Portugal and say, were they producing cloth, how efficient would they be? Could you go to England and say, were they producing wine, how efficient would they be? We usually don't know that. In agriculture, it's possible to get such measures because we can just go to the land, different plots of land, and see and measure what they would have produced even if they're actually growing soybeans on that land, we could still say, were they to grow corn, we could figure out what the yield would be. But let me advance, because that's not what I'm talking about today, but I'm talking about a kind of an evolution from that more stark uh, 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 Ricardian model to one that's a little easier to take to the data. And the first big step in that was, uh, model of Dornbush, Fisher, and Samuelson. And what they did would have seemed to be going in the wrong direction. They made it more complicated in the sense of, uh, rather than having two goods, a cloth and, and wine, we have now a continuum of goods. Uh, I would seem to make it very difficult, but what they realized was that with a continuum of goods, you got kind of the best of both worlds from those two types of Ricardian equilibria because there's gonna be one good which both countries will produce. If there's one good that both countries produce, boom, you know what the relative wage is because they have to, the relative wage has to make the cost of those two goods the same. So right off the bat, you have that one thing. And then secondly, that's only one good on a continuum so you can forget about it. And all the other goods are perfectly specialized, either produced in the one country or produced in the other. That makes it very simple once you have the relative wage to figure out um, whether it satisfies the labor market equilibrium condition. And if it does, you're done. So uh, Dornbush, Fisher, Samuelson could really be synthesized in a picture that looks sort of like supply and demand, although it's not. And it, and it makes the, the model uh, crystal clear in that way. Now, um, what I'm going to, now, in fact, there's a famous, uh, well, maybe not so famous paper of Krugman from 1979. So his most famous work from that period was building up to the monopolistic competition mo model of international trade. This one was not that. This was, interestingly, perfect competition. So you associate Krugman with monopolistic competition. But this paper he wrote at that same time really builds on Dornbusch, Fisher, and Samuelson, uses perfect competition. And I'm going to, and, and 
and it's my first kind of inkling of getting to this idea of the offshoring, because his paper can be used as a way to think about offshoring. I think at heart it's a Ricardian model. I'm gonna, I don't think he would mind my calling it that. He, in fact, cites Dornbush, Fisher, and Samuelson. And so I'll return to that in a moment. It makes it, in, in, in designing this talk, Krugman takes a kind of detour from my, my description of the evolution, but I'm going to bring him back at the end. So we'll see him again. Um, so I want to talk just briefly about uh, my own work with Jonathan Eaton on this. And it, in the same way DFS built on Ricardo, we built on DFS. So we're going to adopt their idea of a continuum of goods. And we're just going to bring in a bunch of countries. Uh, that required reformulating the way we think about uh, describing a comparative advantage, required thinking about it in a probabilistic way. And uh, uh, the idea is the following, and, and I think it's best described by thinking of one good on the continuum and all the different countries that could potentially be producing that good. Now, all these countries are, and I, and I wanted to, in describing this and kind of picking up on what Peter Dreisen mentioned about the R&D in Bavaria, we're kind of th coming from that idea that countries do R&D, whether um, formally or informally, they figure out how to produce things. Um, I'm not gonna be describing a situation where Portugal's good at wine because of the weather or the land, I really want to think about a, a, what I would say is a more modern situation where you're good at things that you've done some research on and figure out a product that, that's efficiently produced. And so the idea of the model to think about it simply is that these ideas for producing some, the same good in different countries of the world are kind of raining down through our efforts at trying to do research in, in some ways. And, and we can think of that as a Poisson process. And countries accumulate knowledge, and that's what I'm calling the uh, TI there. So that's country I's kind of knowledge about production. Bavaria has a big TI. Um, so so um, now you, you can immediately see that no matter what the distribution of these ideas is, the, the probability that uh, a country is going to be the most efficient at producing something will be in proportion to its TI relative to the TI, T, TKs of every other country. That would, if I, if I have more ideas, I'm more likely to be the most efficient producer. Now, the only problem with that, that's kind of absolute advantage. And Ricardo said we have to think about comparative advantage. So what's going to happen instead is that when you think about all the goods, well, Bavaria may be more advanced, and that's going to lead ultimately to its higher wages. What's going to matter is those goods where it's particularly well advanced, and those are going to be kind of the outliers in our probabilistic structure. So our comparative advantage is turned into a kind of measure of the outliers, the places where you're particularly good. Those will be the places where you export. Those where you really didn't get too lucky and didn't make many advances, those are going to be the things you import. If you're Bavaria, you're, you've taken a lot of draws, you're very high in general in your efficiency, but it's going to be those winners where you're going to be exporting. And that's sort of the way in which we map Ricardo into this kind of probabilistic world. Now, to make that thing really work, we need a particular distribution. It's a distribution that can convert um, the wage penalty on the number of ideas. We have to have a mapping between how much it hurts you when you have a higher wage. And the Pareto makes that very simple and leads to an extreme value for your best uh, idea, uh, uh, for your best technologies. OK. So that leads to this, OK, this isn't an equation. It's actually two inequalities, weak inequalities in opposite directions. So the idea, as I explained, if you just ignore the part in parentheses, it's what I claimed was just it's your, it's your TI relative to all the, T, the other TIs. Of course, that denies uh, comparative advantage because 
the country with the bigger TI will have a bigger wage, and so then the wages come in there to kind of dampen that and mean that Bavaria is not exporting everything, because instead part of that's going into a higher wage in Bavaria. And here we're also including the, the role of transport costs, which is very important when you confront a model like this with the data, you need to capture the fact that trade is not as, as the volume of trade is lower than one would have expected in a, in a textbook model. So this, this model, that, that equation together with a, an equation that clears the labor market gives us our Ricardian model. It, it's been used by uh, my colleague Caliendo and, uh, and, and Fernando Perro in evaluating NAFTA. It's been used by Dave Donaldson, the recent Clark Medal uh, winner, to understand the gains from uh, build, building the railroads in India. So it, 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 is, it's, it, it can be used in a very uh, a wide array of, of applications, very quantitative. So, so I think that's where we made some progress. Now, you could say maybe we went, I, I, you know, in each of these steps, I said DFS made it easier. I said thinking about comparative advantage is a probabilistic thing, make it easier. We made assumptions that made it tractable. Maybe we kind of trivialized it. Maybe we kind of threw out the baby with the bathwater. So um, to, to uh, talk about that, uh, uh, paper by uh, Archilakis Costano and Rodriguez Clare point out that a whole bunch of models we use, including the Armington model in which trade is really just part of your preferences you import the, uh, from another country just because you like the goods produced by that country rather than produced by some other country, all generate the same sort of gravity equation that I was showing you. So the, the, the models we use with different, very different names all sort of converge down and, and have the same basic mathematical structure in the end with just different names for some of the variables. Well, and in particular, they made that point by, by saying that, well, you can just invert that trade equation as it applies to the home country and you get an expression for the real wage. That's uh, my equation there, and the real wage depends, as I was saying, on the TI. That's kind of Bavaria's high real wage because of its high level of technology. But that would happen even if they weren't trading. But it also depends on the degree to which they don't just buy their own stuff. That means you're taking part in the world market, and if you're, if you're uh, share of purchases from yourself is low, that means you're gaining a lot from trade. That's the second term in that expression. I'm going to call that G for gains from trade. Now, why is it the gains from trade? Because the technology part you're going to get even if you don't trade. I mean, if Bavaria is very good at producing all these things, well, they're going to do pretty well. They can just uh, drive BMWs and not trade them. But um, uh, you'll do even better if you're trading, and then you'll get that second piece, the part, the, the part I called G. Okay. Now, that's uh, progress. We, should, we need to know when, we're, when we have a, a completely, when our models have kind of converged to the same thing. But I'm arguing that we wouldn't be gathered here if Ricardo had just said that the reason uh, Portugal imports uh, cloth is because the Portuguese people just like that English cloth and they don't like the cloth that they make themselves. It's not a very deep explanation for trade. I don't think we would have been satisfied with that. So maybe there's something we're not capturing of what Ricardo had to tell us. So let me go now back to Krugman because he took a different tack. And he, in this 1979 model, and I think it starts to get at this offshoring issue in a, in a nice way. So for Krugman, he also sort of imagined these innovations raining down. So I'm going to claim that, I mean, he came before us, so we were kind of following in his footsteps in that sense. For him, he was uh, an earlier uh, innovator in terms of thinking of these goods as new varieties. But that does, it turns out that doesn't really matter 
It's just these new goods, and I was talking about them as new production techniques. He just thought of them as new differentiated products. So they're raining down in the one country. Imagine that's, uh, um, so let's make that Bavaria. And then the other countries just kind of sometimes reverse engineering them, or, uh, or um, um, Bavaria may be actually saying, here's how to produce this, now we'll start producing it in Hungary. OK, so the, the two countries here then are north and south. So I got to, uh, my Bavaria example doesn't work great with that, but uh, uh, that's what it's kind of called this north-south model. Now, um, in this world, in Krugman's world, he's kind of a master at making things as simple as you could get away with. Every country is equally, if you know how to do it, you're just as productive as anyone else. So if you can get one of these ideas that rain down into Bavaria, well, you can make a BMW yourself. If, if you know that technology, you'll be equally good at it. So why is the south below the north? It's just because the north knows more. So if Bavaria can stay ahead of the curve enough in terms of innovating, it will still have a higher wage than Hungary, who, who may be um, able to produce those things that they learn how to produce just as well as, as Bavaria can. OK, so that's the model. Now, gains from trade in that model turn out to be different. And yet, part of it looks the same. So the, the second part just looks as before. But now there's a first part as well. In the, in, in the other model, the first part canceled out but doesn't cancel out anymore because if Bavaria was on its own, it would have access to everything it produced and everything it taught Hungary how to produce. Whereas if it's uh, trading, it's actually specializing only in producing those things that nobody else knows how to produce. And so that's why this does capture this tension in outsourcing. So outsourcing I'm going to interpret as moving some of your own technology over to the other country, teaching them how to produce it. That can generate a lot of gains from trade early on because you get to, it gets produced more cheaply for you. But over time, that kind of whittles away some of your gains from trade because at the same time, your second term is going up because the pi NN is going down because you're trading more with the other country. Your first term's getting smaller, and so there's this, we get a kind of hump shape situation. Now, an important point to recognize is that it doesn't mean, trade is always good. The gains from trade are positive. It just means you may, at some point, actually be whittling down your gains from trade by outsourcing and giving away too much of your knowledge. So I think that's just a little bit of a pushback of a purely rosy scenario where just, um, you know, does Ricardo just say uh, every uh, a pure free trade and so on? How much time do I have? Three minutes. Three minutes. OK. So I need two. OK. So the question is, does this generalize? Um, let me just say it in words. Here's how we're going to think about generalizing it. Well, the first idea is by making in our uh, in my initial f formulation with Eaton, we kind of thought of the ideas raining down kind of independently across the countries. Well, that kind of denies Romer's point that technology is inherently non-rival, and it's only partially excludable. And in fact, with offshoring, you may think that you're literally trying to move the technology to a low-cost producer. Um, so now we're going to try and stick with that dictum. And the way we're going to do that is to uh, borrow uh, a, a, a joint distribution from Archilochus, Romando, Rodriguez, Claire, and Yapel. That's a mouthful. Uh, that replaces an idea being just how well you can produce it with an idea being how well it could be produced in any country if they knew about it. And then the second thing we're going to add is like Krugman and say that these ideas that come to you through your own research through time, either through reverse engineering or your own efforts to offshore them to cheaper production places, um, 
slowly become available to other countries. And then with our joint Pareto, we sort of know how good they'll be at producing them once they get them. And I'm just going to show you one thing from this sort of a formulation, which was that we do get an expression for the gains from trade. And it does have more than that second piece. It has this first piece. And not to, uh, I've already overdone my quota of equations, so I'm not going to uh, dwell on it. But the idea is, again, that you can be uh, gaining on the second part and losing on the first part while still gaining from trade, but maybe losing some of the gains from trade that you otherwise would have had. And this equation very nicely co collapses to Krugman in the case of two countries where only one country is really doing innovation. But what we hope is that this equation can be used you know, sort of more broadly, because in the same way that the Ricardian model was held back by its you know, insisting on two countries and two goods, I think uh, Krugman's idea can be held back by its insistence on just a country, a north country, and a south country. So let me conclude before I go over time. I think what's special about Ricardo is it has you think about trade in terms of the production technology. And I think that often is the right way to think about it. Um, it's key for many issues. It's sort of the way you'd want to think about issues like offshoring is in terms of the technology. Uh, I think my lesson from this is we still need to think harder, though, about how we model that technology. And of course, we need to always be thinking about how we're going to quantify it. And I'm sorry, in this talk, I sort of tread lightly on actually how we take these things to the data, more trying to give you a path by which the kind of Ricardian abstract idea could be taken to something that um, confronts, confronts uh, data. So. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm particularly pleased that you uh, put uh, technology and productivity uh, at the center stage again. Uh, so that um, offshoring is actually sort of a roundabout production, to say it in Bumbavak's term, uh, which gives us a larger pie uh, so that distributional issues can be more easily solved than uh, what is actually discussed uh, nowadays. Uh, I have the pleasure introducing the second speaker, which is Peter Neary from Oxford University. Uh, and uh, I have a particular pleasure introducing him because he's from across the channel. And he will give us first uh, impressions uh, on May Day and uh, what he, as a trade economist and an Irishman, of course, uh, thinks uh, about uh, the recent pl political plans uh, we are going to expect. Hmm? Peter? Thank you, Barbara. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, congratulations to the organizers on, uh, on, on, a, on a brilliant idea. Why is there no conference like this in Britain right now? Well, people are thinking about different issues. Uh, so David Ricardo, we've seen the same, the same portrait before, um, 200 years on, and I'm going to talk briefly about uh, his big idea. I'm going to talk about his ideas on income distribution, and there'll be some overlap with some of the previous uh, uh, discussions that we've had. I'm going to talk about developments in trade theory since then, and about policy relevance, and uh, that's quite a tall order, so let me move on. So. Um, you could argue the dawn of economic science. That, that, uh, that's a big claim. I want to explain what I mean about that. Uh, and to do that, I'm going to, again, touching on, on what was discussed earlier, I want to talk about what people understood about trade before Ricardo. And uh, you could say causes of trade 1.0, Adam Smith. He, we can trace comparative advantage in him, and, and um, some, some quotes were given earlier. Uh, but if you look at you know, his, his main quote, which I haven't reproduced here, it's essentially of an absolute advantage. And uh, what does it say? Well, it, 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 it says, 
I'll, co I'll come to exactly what it says in a moment, but um, it, it's a big advance over the predecessors. The predecessors were what we now call mercantilism, uh, not really a formal doctrine, a loose collection of ideas put forward by what we would now call journalists or um, uh, public intellectuals and so on over a period of 100 and 200 years. Not really systematic, uh, but the bottom line was that trade surpluses are good. And it's a very old idea, and it's being revived today. You've, we've heard it already described as a, a loose characterization of the, of the Trump administration's attitude to trade policy. So Adam Smith was a big advance on that. He said, look, get real. Uh, trade surpluses per se are not the issue. Having exports is not the issue. It's, 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 a, it's about consumption. It's about what goods do you want to consume and um, which goods will be best exported and, and um, uh, which goods do we predict will be exported. And essentially, he focused on absolute advantage. And, that, and that's a good idea. It's a good starting point because absolute advantage, the T in the, uh, the slides that, uh, that, that Sam showed just now, uh, is a key determinant of absolute living standards and it's a key determinant of trade volumes. And indeed, sometimes I think as trade economists, we can, uh, I think non-economists tend to focus on the absolute side, and that's good for many p questions. Um, it's unfortunately wrong. Uh, you could say it's clear, simple, and wrong when we try to use it as a theory of trade patterns. And to illustrate that, let me just talk you through the, um, what I might call the curse of common sense. I want to be stressing the scientific side of economics, and the alternative to, to science is common sense, which tells you that Germany is more, more efficient at producing cars than China. So cool, let's think about it. Germany should export uh, cars, isn't that right? Uh, very simple. Um, now, of course, efficiency here is something about real stuff, you know, hard-working German, um, uh, uh, Germans. Or if you're perhaps a bit more plausible, it's Germans who are highly skilled and have lots of capital and so on. But they're efficient more so than, 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 than Chinese work for one reason or another. Um, but then Germany is also more efficient at producing textiles, right? And in which case shouldn't they be exporting textiles to China as well as cars? Um, leave aside balance of payments constraints. The problem then becomes that actually Chinese wages are much lower, so it can produce textiles more cheaply. So is the issue then about uh, efficiency should be measured in money terms? That, that kind of makes sense. So it's not real terms, it's money terms. Uh, except that doesn't make sense because at Chinese wages, they could produce BMWs really, really well. Uh, so what on earth is going on? This is all common sense, and it's, it's wrong. It, it's just going in a loop. It's also slightly dangerous because it does suggest, it does indulge what I call common sense prejudices. And ironically, you can run the prejudices either way. You can say, well, Germany, maybe I should say Bavaria, is exploiting this poor country because it's more efficient and that's mean and nasty. Or you could alternatively say that China's competing unfairly because its, it's, um, uh, its wages are indeed, again, thinking of Trump arguments, its currency are too low. The bottom line is this is all a mess, okay? It's, uh, it's 1.0. It hits on an important issue, but it doesn't get the pattern of trade at all right. For that, we need um, Ricardo's big idea. And once again, I think I'm the third person to quote this, um, uh, this famous line or variants of it. Samuelson, um, who indeed didn't think quickly at the dinner party, he got what the French call esprit d'escalier, the wit of the staircase. As you're going down after the dinner party, you think, why didn't I say that at the time? And shut up this, this, this smart mathematician. So his line is that comparative advantage is true, and it's also not obvious. Thousands of intelligent men and, uh, he didn't, what did he say, uh, important and intelligent men. He didn't say whether the women were unimportant, un unintelligent, or just not existent. But anyway, this was a long time ago. They've never been able to grasp the doctrine. And it is subtle. It is complicated. In a, the, the, the key idea is that it emphasizes not differences, but differences in differences. It, it's, the, it, it's two separate comparisons that you're making. So even to express it is a mouthful. Relative to China, Germany is relatively more efficient at producing cars than textiles. Okay? That, that's a bit of a mouthful. And getting, getting it across and getting it across to students, uh, whether with traditional models, with the modern uh, 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 approaches or whatever, uh, is, 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 a bi is, is a big push. But it does make a number of important predictions. Ch uh, Germany will export cars. China will export textiles. The double difference gets rid of all the mess from the previous slide. Exchange rates and prices, they, they do matter. I'm, I'm not saying that, that uh, sorry, uh, wage, wa wages don't matter. Of, co of course they matter. Um, they matter for living standards. They matter for levels of affluence before and after trade. Again, as comes out very clearly in, in, the, in the equations that, uh, that Sam showed. But they don't matter per se for the direction of trade. 
Okay? So it's this double difference that's key. Uh, it also makes a prediction about gains from trade. You can think of this in a more different formulation as saying, as, as, as Daniel was emphasizing, if you start with an assumption of gains from trade, you can prove the pattern of trade uh, more directly. But in the simplest cases, you, you do get the prediction that both countries gain. Crucially, trade is not a zero-sum game. So this is all well known probably to most people in the audience, but let me just make a few points about this. One is that you can see this as the invention of economic theory. Uh, it's, it's a priori reasoning, it deliberately simplified assumptions. Uh, I, I would argue that's the second essential for, uh, for, for a science. The first essential was there, and when I say I've criticized Adam Smith, but don't let me knock him too much, do, do remember that that Scotsman uh, from the Celtic fringe of the British Isles, his, he, he had a very broad perspective. He, he thought of big questions, and bi he had the big picture. And uh, he was also concerned with empirics, his famous passage on, on a pin factory. I don't know how much is known. I'm not an expert on the, on, on, on the scholarship. I don't know whether, he, whether we know if he actually visited at a pin factory, but you, you read the paragraph, it sounds like he did. That's pretty cool. I don't think Ricardo ever went inside a pin factory. Uh, I doubt if he left his stockbroker belt uh, 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 very, uh, uh, very much. So what we need is, we need the theory and we need the empirics uh, and, the, um, uh, and, and we do kind of need the, the broad vision, the, the big questions as well. Uh, Smith, you could say, provided to, uh, Two of those, really combining them, and um, Ricardo gave us the analytic tradition, the th tradition of starting from assumptions, building up to conclusions, uh, which is really where we are now, the essence of science. That was Ricardo's contribution to what we know today and think of as uh, the determinants of trade. He also made a very important contribution to income distribution. Again, this was touched on earlier. Let me briefly mention it in his analysis of corn laws. He... Um, he basically pointed out eliminating corn tariffs would harm landowners, help laborers. Well, yes, if the wage was, was, was rigid. If not, then it would, the benefits would be passed on to capitalists. And capital in his setting was really just deferring output. It was the, the, next, the, the, the output that was set aside to assist in production in the next period. A, a complicated and confused way of thinking about capital, not the modern way. His focus was on land, on, 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 on labor as the, uh, uh, as the determinant of value, what uh, George Stigler called a a 93% labor theory of value. That was his focus. Well, all of that is, 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 is a bit distant from us now. We, we know a lot more about that. But the key idea of trade having important distributional effects, that, that, that's very much there. It has to be said, if Ricardo did uh, determinants of trade 2.0, he did trade and income distribution 1.0. It, it's a good starting point. It is very commonsensical, and, and it's not wrong, absolutely. Uh, it, it does highlight a central mechanism. On the other hand, at, at best, uh, it can be interpreted as a version of the specific factors model. This, again, was mentioned earlier in a piece by uh, Ron Findlay uh, many years ago. Uh, he spelt this out in some detail. And it, it, it's, um, the specific factors model thinks of each individual sector as having its own factor, which is uniquely specific to that, and whose fortunes therefore will be tied to the fortunes of that sector. That's not a bad way to think about, uh, about economies in terms of income distribution, but it's not a particularly good way, especially over time. Maybe in the short run you can think of, you know, workers can't move, capital cannot move, goods are, you know, pr production processes are, are rigid and laid down. But over time you would think of, um, uh, of movements and adjustments taking place. So later work has been extended to many intersectorally mobile factors, and we get the work of Hector and Olin and more modern, modern, uh, modern ideas in that, tr in that tradition, which have, ed which have, you know, much made much more complex and made made, made much more, more much more subtle the arguments about income distribution that um, that we can trace back to Ricardo. Now there is another point, and this also was mentioned earlier, that Ricardo's ideas on income distribution were not at all integrated with his theory of comparative advantage. There are some in the in, in the book, in the, in the big book, the 1817 book, some also in his earlier pamphlet, but they're in different chapters and there's no link between them. And there's an interesting parallel here. That's also true in the modern Ricardian theories. The modern Ricardian theories don't talk about income distribution. They don't talk about different factors of production. When we, uh, when we want to do that, we fall back on a different tradition, the, the hector Olin tradition that I've mentioned. Is that a good or a bad thing? Well, I think it, has, it can be defended. It has a very good side in that this is what... Uh, 
This is how theory progresses. There's nothing wrong with having more than one model. You don't need a single model. There are people who have, who have said the opposite. They've said there is only, there's a lovely quote from Ivor Pierce, an old uh, British economist, uh, there is only one world and we need only one model to describe it. That, I think, is just wrong. The notion that you can get one giant computer model of the world, and uh, once you get to that, then you'll be able to answer every single question with the one model. Uh, the world is too big to be encompassed by a, by a single model, even, even the world of economics. So we need different models, and Ricardo can, again, be seen as the pioneer of that. You want to understand trade patterns. You make one set of assumptions and follow through their implications. You, uh, you want to understand income distribution. You make a different set of assumptions, and you try and follow them through. Non-economists, dare I say non-scientists, find this sometimes a bit confusing and a bit off-putting. And perhaps it's true that if we really want to think about how determinants of trade and income distribution inter inter intersect, maybe we should be building bigger models, at least in an experimental way, to see how they interact. So maybe we should be trying to put multiple factors into the eaton Corton model or in other ways trying to integrate these different insights. Probably that will require uh, uh, a computer, uh, uh, computers to solve. It won't, be able, it won't be possible to do analytically. And we will need to fall back on the simple, tr analytically tractable models in order to explain how the bigger computer models are actually working. So um, that's what we have learned from Ricardo. I, we, have, we have learned an awful lot since then, though. I want to very briefly mention some other things that have come up. One obvious one, which was implicit in, in, in Sam's uh, explanation, but um, uh, he didn't talk so much about it, is, uh, is, 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 is central to modern understanding of trade, uh, and that is the gravity model. Uh, trade falls away with distance. That started as an empirical observation by Jan Tinbergen, later a Nobel Prize winner in the 1930s, and for many years became, um, uh, became uh, uh, noted but remarkably devoid of theoretical foundations. And it's only in the last 20 years or so that suddenly we now think we do actually understand. We, we, we have a very good understanding of, of what's going on. Uh, and essentially, it does boil down much more to absolute rather than comparative advantage, or at least to the absolute advantage terms that are in there that we saw earlier in, um, uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in Sam's equations. That's a key idea. And in terms of explaining overall volume of trade, it's something which writers before the empirical revolution, before the data was available, it was an issue that really didn't come up so much. And uh, it's only more recently the combination of data and new theory has allowed us to think about it. A second dimension of the, re of the modern world, which did not exist in Ricardo's time, which has given rise to a huge range of, uh, of work, is the idea of intra-industry trade. The trade is not just about countries exploiting differences between them, but it can actually reflect similarities. Countries which are producing essentially the same good, but different varieties of the same good. They're, so products are differentiated. And in that context, specialization, once again, in Ricardo is good because by specializing, you do what you do well, and you get um, uh, to purchase what other countries do better, relatively better. Uh, with increasing return, with, sorry, with, with product differentiation, by specializing, you benefit from increasing returns. You have a longer product line if you're serving more markets with your variety. The, f the foreign firm selling a close substitute, a close competitor for your good, also benefits by, uh, by, by moving down its cost curve and um, benefiting from increasing returns. Now, I think it's fair to say that this pattern of trade does seem to dominate uh, trade between similar economies. By construction, if economies are actually identical, again, thinking of that you know, as, 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 as a theoretical uh, uh, ab abstraction, if countries are totally identical, there is no possibility for comparative advantage trade. Uh, so to explain the actual trade we see, the volume, very high volumes of trade between relatively similar economies, we need something like this theory. It's very plausible. Uh, it's confirmed by evidence. It implies an additional source of gains from trade. When people try to put numbers on this, it turns out they're not very high, but they're there. There are gains from increased variety, increased diversity of choice. Go to your supermarket today <coughs> excuse me, and look at the range of, of goods that is available. Uh, it vastly dominates what was true only, only 30, 40 years ago. Much of this due to trade or the happy coincidence of trade and improved technology. And all of that is undoubtedly an improvement in welfare. 
There's one other crucial point that I'd want to stress, and this goes back, we mentioned early Krugman papers. There's another early Krugman paper in 1970, JPE for, uh, for specialists, which, um, <clears throat> which again doesn't really talk so much about um, uh, monopolistic competition as a cause of trade, but emphasizes the fact that this kind of trade generates much lower cost of adjustment. So go back to Ricardo and the Corn Laws, or just think about comparative advantage trade in general. The whole point is that countries are different. If they're not trading, initially they're very different, specialized in different directions. After trade, they will have to adjust. Think of Germany and China. In the absence of trade, uh, Germany produces cars, uh, China textiles, but both also produce their own, not perhaps as efficiently, uh, textiles on the one hand, cars on the other. Following trade, the German textile industry collapses and the, um, two minutes, two minutes, okay, fine, uh, three minutes. Okay, sorry, I've less, I was hoping I had 25 minutes. Uh, so I have 20, forgive me. So let me move on very quickly to uh, just to say that um, a key idea of inter industry trade is that costs of adjustment are indeed minimized. And uh, that's essential, uh, uh, really quite different from, um, from, from uh, um, comparative advantage trade. Trade in intermediate goods has been mentioned already, uh, and perhaps I won't, given time, spend too much time on it. I will just finish by mentioning what I will finish this slide by talking about more broadly the advent of big data and the advent of computers, which have allowed us to analyze this data and also to quantify the effects that I'm talking about, that's been a, a major breakthrough. This is, isn't really number four because it feeds into numbers one, two, and three, and, uh, and indeed to all the previous work, commodity advantage and income distribution, and allows us to think of these things together. Uh, it's part of the ongoing development of international trade, economics more generally, as a scientific study, an imperfect science, not a precise science like physics, uh, but nonetheless one that does draw the line from data to, uh, uh, from theories to data via, via computer models. What about policy relevance? I perhaps don't need to explain the policy relevance of all these ideas to Day, but maybe I will test your, uh, your recognition. What are these people doing? Uh, so you've seen this pair. This is Donald Trump and Theresa May. They're celebrating a special relationship. This, this pair you may not be so familiar with. This is Liam Fox. He's the Minister for International Trade in the current UK government, on record as saying that gravity doesn't apply anymore. And he's shaking hands there with Rodrigo Duterte, the president of the Philippines, uh, and talking about shared values between Britain and the, uh, and the Philippines. What is um, what's this got to do with anything I've said? Well, there's a clue that you might think, uh, what's, what's in common? Hands, maybe? Holding hands, shaking hands, tiny hands. Um, <laughs> Hands, which by their own by their owner's admission have done horrible and possibly illegal things to, to women, um, but here's a clue: hands, which by their own admission have pushed uh, unconvicted suspects out of helicopters. Well, that may be a clue because in future they may just be uh, be British helicopters. They're uh, they're discussing trade agreements. That's what these people are doing right now in Britain. People talk trade agreements the whole time. They talk about it in kind of strange and peculiar ways and. Uh, one can, this is my last slide, uh, to end on this note, what, does, what do the theories that we've talked about so far, what do they suggest if you're choosing your trade partners? You're in a magical dance, you can choose who you want to trade with in a way where Britain finds itself now. And the lessons from Ricardo would be that uh, countries that are very different have the potential for very large gains, but also the potential for considerable disruption. Disruption will be greatest the more different are the countries that you, uh, 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 that you link with. So what should be the ideal trade agreement? Well, it depends on how you value that disruption. If, as right now, politicians of all kinds, perhaps, are nervous about the disruption due to trade, then you do want to respect comparative advantage, but maybe not too much. You do want to uh, have a deep agreement, which includes not just the kinds of banning of trade that Ricardo had in mind, not just the tariffs that uh, uh, until the mid-century, mid uh, mid-20th century economists had in mind, but all the behind-the-border type regulations and barriers to trade. You would also like it to be comprehensive, covering agriculture and services, as well as industry. And finally, picking up on, um, on gravity, you'd like it to be with nearby countries, working with gravity rather than against it. Uh, so what's the idea? trade agreement for the UK? Well, it's actually the single market. <laughs> Sorry about that. And I will leave... Uh so the, the legacy, sorry, <laughs> I'm going too quickly. The legacy of Ricardo, I think, is economics as a science. Uh, standing on the shoulders of this giant, he developed theory, which we bring to data with modern econometrics, with enormous relevance to current policy debates, and with lessons for policymakers today, which they will ignore at their peril. 
So I'll end with uh, them from the March for Science. This is a dog wearing a, a caption, I'm a cat, citation needed. Uh, we trade, let's leave the single market and join, and join a sing, uh, have trade agreements with the rest of the world, citation needed. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Peter, for your take on uh, May Day. And uh, you already gave me the word disruption. And I'd like to hand over uh, to the third speaker who tries to illuminate a little bit of the uh, second kind of Ricardo, uh, which uh, is seldom discussed. Uh, and it's um, uh, um, Peter uh, Willi Kohler from Tübingen University. And he will give his comments on the second kind of uh, Ricardo. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there a presentation? OK. Well, um, thank you very much. I'm uh, honored and privileged to stand here. Thanks uh, to the organizers for having me here. Thanks to all of you for hanging on in this room at a time where you should actually have coffee. But I stick to my 10 minutes nonetheless. Uh, and I have 10 slides too. And I have to rush you through these slides. It will be uh, relatively fast. If at the end of time you feel it was too fast, uh, there is a little article that I have written jointly with my friend and co-author Benny Jung, which will appear in German, though, uh, in the IFO Schnelldienst. So I don't feel too bad about being fast. Um, let me start off with uh, a little bit of maybe confusing numerology. I make a distinction here between Ricardo 150077 and 2017. Uh, 2017, of course, refers to Ricardo today, and there's two meanings to this in my view. One is, of course, the well-known so-called Ricardian model, uh, meaning single input linear technology. And the second is uh, a broader sense in which we stand, we all stand on Ricardo's shoulders, and that is whenever we deal with the gains from trade theorem. Uh, uh, Daniel has pointed out uh, that there are many very general versions of the gains from trade theorem, and all of them can be traced back, in my view, to Ricardo. Ricardo really was the first person in history to um, look at the gains from trade from a theoretical perspective. He was a trade theorist, you'd now say, looking at normative trade theory, perhaps more than positive trade theory. Um, at his time, we can make a distinction between the kind of Ricardo that we have talked about a lot now, uh, the comparative advantage Ricardo. I, this is Ricardo 177. It's 177 because it's the seventh chapter in the Principles of Economics and Taxation, published in 1817. Um, we all know this. It's the famous cloth wine example, mainly an, exam an example which Ricardo used not so much, in my view, it to explain the pattern of trade, uh, I don't think that people would have needed that. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's mainly an example to illustrate the gains from trade. Um, and then there is the Ricardian system, uh, which I call Ricardo 15, uh, 15.0. Uh, this is what Doug was pointing out earlier, sometimes also called the Ricardian system, going back to his essay on profits, uh, his corn model. Uh, and oddly enough, I would say that uh, Ricardian trade models have mainly been inspired by Ricardo 7.7 only, and Ricardo 15.0 has been largely uh, ignored and neglected in modern trade theory. Modern trade theory, uh, of course, um, was right to, uh, to use uh, Ricardo 17.7 um, in some sense, of course. Uh, the big boost for uh, modern Ricardian models came for, from uh, the famous paper by Don Buffish and Samuelson, in uh, 1977. That's when they got, or the Ricardian model was stripped from its tunis, in a sense. Uh, and, but maybe more importantly, uh, the uh, uh, famous paper by Eaton and Cortum was connect connecting Ricardo to the gravity equation. And that, in my view, paved the way for the Ricardian model into modern uh, new quantitative trade theory. New quantitative trade theory means that we put numbers on those gains from trade, not just gains from trade, but maybe more importantly, gains from trade liberalization. Uh, you find two modern examples here, one by Caliendo and Paro, the other by IFO authors, uh, dealing with uh, gains from trade uh, using a Ricardian, a modern Ricardian model. 
let me move to, um, just very briefly, to Ricardo. I think Ricardo, uh, Ricardo in, in his days, um, Ricardo, if he was a theorist, he was also a policy-oriented theorist. And his main uh, objective was to abolish uh, the corn laws. He was unsuccessful, of course. Corn laws were not abolished before 1846, and he died, had died in 1823. That, of course, begs the question of we, whether or not we, we could have a thought experiment, whether we could have put IFO at Ricardo's rescue. Um, the question that I have in mind is whether Ricardo would have been more successful in fighting the corn laws if he had all the brain power and the computing power of IFO at its disposal. Uh, two questions come up. First, had he been able to put numbers on the gains from trade, uh, would have been more successful? My take would be no. Uh, Doug was humble enough to not mention the papers that he has written on this issue. My take from that literature from the economic historians was that if he had been able to co come up with th that sort of number, he wouldn't have made much of a difference. But maybe that is wrong. More importantly, the question is what kind of model would Ricardo have or have asked IFO to, to develop, and it's not, in my view, would not have been a new quantitative trade theory Ricardo model. It would have been a Ricardo model of uh, the um, flavor of Ricardo for 15, 15.0, uh, the corn model. Um, and there is an irony here in, in the sense that uh, modern uh, Ricardian models are sometimes charged or criticized for not addressing, being able to address distributional issues, whereas in Ricardo's time, Ricardo 15.0, uh, Doug has pointed this out, the distributional consequences of trade was, were more important for him, for his case for free trade and for, for abolishing the corn laws. Uh, and yet that has largely been ex uh, kind of lost meanwhile. Uh, although there are uh, exceptions, I, I mentioned these very briefly here. So um, let's turn to Ricardo 15.0 just for a second. We're moving back, although I'm supposed to talk about Ricardo today, but uh, I move back very briefly to explain uh, in, in modern terms what uh, Ricardo 15.0, that corn model, means. It's a full-fledged general equilibrium model uh, with the following assumptions. Two goods, corn uh, and industry. Three factors, land, capital, and labor, whereby capital is a bit odd from today's perspective is, uh, is a special factor. It's the, 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 a fund consisting of the wage good that is accumulated through time. And importantly, capital and labor are both mobile across sectors, and there is a uniform rate of profit. And there is a short and a long-run equilibrium. It's a, it's a dynamic model and uh, can be used to consider both an open and a closed economy, although Ricardo in this uh, essay on profit mainly used it for a closed economy. Um, we, he, just a few equations here. Uh, the first equation uh, gives you the rate of profit on the left-hand side if you produce corn. It's corn output minus uh, the uh, rent going to, uh, to landowners minus uh, the wage ten, times the, 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 the workers used divided by the stock of capital used, which is the wage fund. Uh, on the right-hand side, you have the same rate of profit for um, industry. Um, you could look at this as a, some version of a zero profit equilibrium condition, although profits are not zero, but important uh, here is that they are the same in both industries. Uh, this equation implies the labor theory of value, which is the next equation, uh, the price of the industrial good being equal to the relative uh, input coefficients, except for the fact that the input coefficient for corn is variable. Uh, that is determined uh, at the extensive margin of industrial production. Uh, and then you have the rate of profit written down here. <laughs> Importantly, it depends upon the labor allocation between these two sectors, uh, industry and agriculture, or corn. Uh, and now you can uh, think of what the repeal of the corn laws would imply. It would imply a reduction in the relative price of the um, of corn, which, impl which implies that the relative price of uh, the industrial good increases. Uh, and that I can, must be very short here. That has distributional consequences. Landowners, okay, landowners uh, gain, uh, sorry, landowners uh, uh, suffer an income loss. There is uh, an income increase, uh, uh, there is an increase in the, must be slow, <laughs> and there's an increase in, 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 in profits, and subsequently also an accumulation of the wage fund. In the short run, in the very short run, there is no effect, as Doug has mentioned, on workers, 
but in the medium run there will be an, an effect because of the accumulation of capital. And there will therefore be a growth effect of trade liberalization. Uh, and you can look at uh, the long run um, effect looking at a small open economy and a large open economy. For a small open economy, uh, the extensive margin of agricultural production is given from the price of uh, the industrial good, which is given from world markets. So there is adjustment of the wage rate, and that is an increase in the wage rate too. Uh, so uh, workers do, do gain, according to this view. Of course, in the long run, the Malthusian uh, view kicks in. In the long run, there is subsistence wage. Uh, what trade does still in, 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 this, in, in, a, in a large economy is uh, kind of um, postponing that dismal point where there is no uh, accumulation anymore, wages are down to the subsistence level, that dismal state for which economics is also called the dismal science. Uh, the effect of trade is that that is postponed for one economy but not for the other. So here you have something like uh, trade being a zero-sum effect. What is a puzzle is how Ricardo could be uh, favoring trade, at, you know, uh, realizing uh, that there is so, so strong distributional effects. Um, and from a modern perspective, he would say, okay, uh, his gains from trade theorem tells him that there is an expansion of the production, no, the, the consumption possibility set that uh, would allow uh, compensation. But Ricardo, I think, would not have allowed for compensation because that would have killed all the growth effects from trade. Uh, th that's a puzzle that modern theory uh, takes up in, um, in a paper by uh, Antras and others by including distributional effects in the social welfare function. That's one way, and I think that's an important point of departure these days where we should uh, kind of um, move into territory which, uh, which you could call Ricardian because they are addressing distributional issues. I have no time left, so uh, I'm afraid I did use more than one minute per slide. Uh, Still, uh, I have to stop here, and I uh, may refer again to uh, the uh, article that you find in the IFO Schnelldienst in case you're, uh, you're interested. Thank you very much.